Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Gwen Taylor, Senior Developmental Editor and Webinar Program Manager with Current Protocols at John Wiley & Sons Publishers, and I'm delighted to introduce today's webinar on Plant Genome Editing and Engineering. This webinar is being co-sponsored by Current Protocols and the American Society of Plant Biologists. The American Society of Plant Biologists publishes two world-class journals, Plant Physiology and The Plant Cell. The Society also organizes conferences that are key to the advancement of science and provides a forum to serve the basic interests of plant science. Membership in the American Society of Plant Biologists is open to anyone from any nation who is engaged with the full spectrum of plant science research, from fundamental to applied. Current Protocols is in its 29th year and is the gold standard collection of peer-reviewed, authoritative, and regularly updated step-by-step -step research protocols for life scientists worldwide. With 18 titles and 18,000 protocols, Current Protocols is part of Wiley Publishers. During today's program, we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the event by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will not be seen by any of the other attendees. The webinar will be recorded and available for viewing in the next few days, and we will send you an email with details on how to access the on-demand webinar along with a customizable certificate of attendance. So now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Dr. James Birchler is a Curator's Professor of Biological Sciences at the University of Missouri in Columbia. Research interests in his laboratory include structure and behavior of chromosomes, centromere epigenetics, heterosis, polyploidy, and aneuploidy using maize as a model organism. In general, the laboratory studies the consequences of dosage-sensitive gene regulatory mechanisms in multicellular eukaryotes and their implications for the phenotype and evolutionary processes. Among many other leadership roles and honors, Dr. Birchler is a member of the United States National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Dan Voitas is a professor in the Department of Genetics, Cell Biology and Development, and is the director of the Center for Genome Engineering at the University of Minnesota. Specializing in molecular biology and genetics, Dr. Voitas's research focuses on genome modification using nucleases that recognize specific DNA sequences. He co-founded the Zinc Finger Consortium, and his lab developed a superior class of sequence-specific nucleases called talons, which was heralded by Science Magazine of one, as one of the top 10 scientific breakthroughs of 2012. Dr. Voitas's lab is currently optimizing methods for efficiently making targeted genome modifications in a variety of plant species to advance basic biology and to develop new crop varieties. So let's go ahead and get started with a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Bertler. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to welcome all of the participants. In this section, we will talk about the construction and application of engineered mini chromosomes in plants. The idea of uh, artificial chromosomes uh, has potential for modifying plants for a variety of purposes, for food, fuel, pharmaceuticals. And the advantage is that it potentially has is that it will allow the controlled expression of transgenes in a known chromosomal position and allow those to be stacked on an independent chromosome that is not associated with the other chromosomes in a particular species. So potentially going forward, one could add whole biochemical pathways for new properties to plants or have a mass production of useful proteins or metabolite metabolites. And then we will talk about later uh, haploid inducers and how one can use engineered mini chromosomes uh, for transferring transgenes to many lines. And so the, this type of engineering, genetic engineering, is on a much larger scale than what you'll hear about in the second part of the webinar of gene editing techniques. And so we can work uh, potentially on the megabase level uh, to add uh, new ways of, of adding new properties to plants. And then, of course, it's also useful for basic understanding of what makes a chromosome work. 
the whole concept of artificial chromosomes originated in yeast some decades ago, and that was performed by taking centromere sequences, a selectable marker, an origin of replication, capped off by the ends of chromosomes called telomeres. However, uh, this has often been thought to be uh, an idea to use a similar kind of approach in plants, but the centromeres in yeast are unusual in that they uh, actually determine where the kinetic or that part of a chromosome that's involved in chromosome movement, is located. But in plants, the centromere activity is so-called epigenetic. In other words, it does not rely on the DNA sequence that is underlying that position, but instead it relies upon a particular version of histone 3 called SynH3 uh, that is potentially determined by its pre-existing presence on the chromosome. So the epigenetic specification, specification of centromeres, we we'll just briefly talk about this because it's an important aspect in terms of engineered many chromosomes. So a number of people have attempted to take centromere sequences and transform them into plants to see if they will work autonomously. And what inevitably happens is, is that those sequences will integrate stably and not organize a kinetic core at the position of where they're now located. In addition, our laboratory has also been involved in studying centromeres. And we and others have found that there are numerous cases of centromere inactivation and therefore those sequences don't determine where a centromere will be formed. And secondly, we and others have found that uh, centromeres can be formed de novo on chromosome fragments over positions that have unique DNA and do not have the canonical sequences present. So this is an issue that needs to be uh, understood in making artificial chromosomes uh, that um, is needed to be there. Uh, and so as a way of background, uh, I will just introduce a little bit about what we call maze chromosomeomics. So some years ago, we developed a way to distinguish each of the 10 chromosomes of maize shown here using 4S and NC2 tags. And so we can follow chromosomes uh, by using uh, this particular approach and know which chromosome we're working with in any particular uh, karyotype preparation. We also developed a technique for visualizing single genes or single transgenes, and so this is very useful in the production of engineered mini chromosomes and the determination of the location of transgenes. I also want to talk about a supernumerate chromosome or B chromosome in maize because this played uh, an important role in the production of engineered B chromosomes. These chromosomes are basically inert. Uh, centromere is at position label number one here. And the reason why the B chromosome can be maintained in maize stocks is that it has two properties. One, it undergoes non-disjunction at the second polymitosis that makes the two sperm. And then of the two sperm, the one that has the B chromosomes will preferentially fertilize the egg as opposed to the polar nuclei in the process of double fertilization. And so those two properties serve as a drive mechanism to keep it in populations, despite the fact that it is neither needed nor detrimental at low copy number. The centromere also has a repeated sequence that's specific to the B chromosome, and that allows us then to study that particular chromosome centromere against the background of all the others that are in the nucleus at the same time. Little arrows here point to B chromosomes, uh, just showing that they are extra chromosomes in the maze carry type. So now let's turn our attention to artificial chromosome construction. The way that it was conducted because of this epigenetic basis of centromeres is was to use telomere-mediated truncation. What this involves is taking the ends of chromosomes, the telomere repeats, and transforming them in. And what this will do is that it will cleave the chromosome at the site of insertion. And so you could have an otherwise internal site, and when the transgene containing a telomere inserts there, 
then the distal part of the chromosome becomes lost. So the important feature is, is that the telomere repeats have to be on only one side of the introduced transgene. And this is critical for um, the chromosome cleavage. Using transformation, agrobacterium transformation of a construct carrying many copies of the telomere repeat was transformed, and then we could recognize those truncations using our cytological assay of fish theory type analysis. So unlike centromere sequences, the telomere sequences do in fact determine uh, the activity of a telomere. In this um, slide, we have uh, the telomere-mediated truncation illustrated. We have a, a diagram of a maze chromosome. The green areas represent telomeres, the red a centromere. And then we have our transformation construct in which we have green telomeres on one side, and the blue will, in, will indicate new genes that we want to add at the terminus where the truncation happens. So in the process of transformation, there is a double strand break in the chromosome, and in some instances, that transgene coming in will stably insert. That happens at a regular frequency. But at part of the time that you get these insertions, the telomere on the transgene, when it's oriented distally, will break the chromosome, and the end of the chromosome then will be lost, and telomere-mediated truncation has occurred. So we like to use the B chromosome platform because it's this basically inert chromosome. And so by using transformation uh, in this particular instance uh, biolistically, uh, we could truncate both uh, the normal A chromosomes and the B chromosomes by introducing uh, this type of transgene into maize cells. The truncated B chromosomes have an advantage of being this inert chromosome, but it also uh, will now behave normally because the non-disjunction property of the B chromosome relies upon the very distal tip of the B chromosome to be present in the same nucleus as the centromere for non-disjunction. So a truncation event basically will stabilize the B chromosome. So we get both uh, an engineered mini chromosome out of it and the engineered mini chromosome now has stable inheritance. So the way that we do this, uh, we use a maze line that has many B chromosomes in it, indicated there by the arrows, and we blast them into the cells, uh, the plasmids that have telomeres on one side of the transgene. This results in truncated B chromosomes. In this particular case, there are actually two of them in this cell. Depicted in the upper left is the green signal is the B-specific centromere that's specifically identified. And the red signal is the added transgenes that are now at the terminus of the chromosome where it has been truncated. One can see that the truncation events have occurred in different places on the B chromosome. Here's an example of a truncated B chromosome in which basically only the centromere of the B chromosome remains, and in the upper right, one can see the red signal uh, indicating that transgenes have been added uh, with the uh, truncation as a simultaneous event. One of the issues that is often uh, asked about uh, telomere located genes is whether or not they are expressed and subjected to silencing. We have no reason to suspect that this occurs. Um, all of the transgenes that we've examined, in this particular case, we have a guest reporter uh, on a truncated mini chromosome at the terminus of the chromosome, and the blue signal indicates that the guest reporter is expressed uh, with good fidelity. Of course, Many species of plants have no B chromosomes. In fact, most of them don't. But a number of other people and other laboratories have introduced ways of making the platforms for engineered uh, mini chromosomes uh, in the absence of B chromosomes. 
The popular way is to start with tetraploids. This has been done in Arabidopsis and barley by the uh, authors that are listed there on the slide. And this works because the truncated chromosome then, after meiosis, will segregate with a normal chromosome, and the truncated chromosome then is not lost due to any missing genes that would ordinarily be present on a truncated chromosome. Another approach that's been used in rice is to begin with a line that has an extra chromosome in it referred to as a telotrisomy. So these have been produced for every arm of the chromosomes of rice, and they consist of simply a centromere at one end of the chromosome with one chromosome arm. And starting with that as the starting material, doing telomere-mediated truncation, it was possible to recover a small chromosome that had the centromere and little else present together with the added transgenes. In wheat, telotrisomic lines are also available, but there is also the introduced B chromosome from rye that could potentially be used. We have also uh, recovered many chromosomes from diploid maze, uh, potentially by making a very small chromosome and then there's a spontaneous doubling of the remaining homolog that allows those many chromosomes to survive. So it's not really necessary to have even B chromosomes, tetraploids, telotrisomics, many chromosomes can indeed made, be made from starting material of diploid progenitor lines. So let's talk a little bit about the meiotic and somatic stability of engineered mini chromosomes. This is very oftentimes something of interest. In meiosis, what we find is that small chromosomes cannot find their homolog, and therefore, when there are more than one of them present, they basically independently assort from each other. This, of course, will not give 100% transmission of a pair of homologs. But it has some advantages that we'll talk about in uh, later uh, slides in this presentation. Also, all chromosomes that have been studied that are small in maize show a lack of sister chromatid cohesion at anaphase 1 of meiosis. And of course, this is in contrast to normal chromosomes. But these particular parameters of small chromosomes, we think, can be overcome. Uh, that I'll mention in just a moment. Here's an image of meiotic, meiotic anaphase 1 showing seven mini chromosomes. Uh, those are depicted as the red small chromosomes. And one can see that uh, they do not find their pairing partner and are independently uh, proceeding to the poles of meiosis. At the lower center, one can see two small red dots. That is a single mini B that the sisters are separating in anaphase one, showing that the sisters do not have a typical sister cohesion at this particular meiotic division. So these issues of small chromosomes, we think they can be overcome uh, by a variety of techniques. One of them might be uh, placing a restore fertility onto the mini chromosome in a background of either cytoplasmic or nuclear male sterility. And therefore, uh, the only pollen grains that will be uh, effective will be and viable will be those that have the restore fertility. Uh, and therefore, that will be the only pollen grains that can transmit their mini chromosome cargo to the next generation. Both maize and rice have such systems, and so the potential uh, exists to apply this to uh, increase the fidelity of the transmission of the engineered mini chromosomes. The somatic stability of mini chromosomes appears to be similar to normal chromosomes. There appears to be no issue uh, in that case uh, in terms of how they are transmitted from one cell division to the next. So where we are headed into the future is to amend the mini chromosomes, and we are taking a variety of approaches to do this. 
One of them is to modify a stacking system that has been demonstrated already by David Al. The uh, citations to that work are provided on this slide. This basically involves taking multiple site-specific recombination uh, systems. In our case, we are using Crelox and 5C31 Integrase. And by combining them, as did the Al Laboratory, one can continually add to a pre-existing site in the chromosomes, in this case on the mini chromosomes, to add new genes uh, to the cargo that is present there. So in the diagram, the block, the clear block, designates a centromere, the green repeats are the telomere, and then gene one is the genes that were placed there in the initial truncation event. And then using the stacking system, we can add genes two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, et cetera, uh, in perpetuity uh, using this kind of stacking system. We're also working, I mentioned in the introduction that uh, this type of approach of mini chromosomes can work at much larger, larger uh, types of genetic engineering than gene editing, and so we are working on building mini chromosomes in very large increments. The approach we're taking is to first integrate a buyback, which we've demonstrated will work in maize. This combines both the agrobacterium functions for transformation and the bacterial artificial chromosome functions typical of back clones. We transform that in, we make then a B chromosome, we truncate it with the receptor sites, and then using uh, the site-specific recombination systems of Cre and integrase, we'll circularize uh, the uh, insert into the chromosome using Cre, and then integrase is a non-reversible reaction, and so that has the potential then to insert it into uh, the engineered mini-B chromosome. So the system that we have developed is one in which we can take the mini chromosome and through successive introductions of back-sized pieces, we can continually add uh, more and more cargo to the engineered mini chromosome to grow it by approximately 100 kilobase increments to add large genes, clusters of genes, pathways, uh, any kind of large cargo in multiple uh, insertion events. So now I want to turn to combining engineered mini chromosomes with doubled haploid breeding. This has the potential of several interesting applications of engineered mini chromosomes. So doubled haploid breeding is used for many crops, including maize. There are haploid inducer lines. One occurs naturally for maize, but others have been developed using a modified SynH3 that we talked about earlier. And these will produce haploids from one parent. In maize, the natural one will produce haploids at about 10% of the progeny. These this haploids then can be doubled by agents that block mitotic metaphases uh, during development, and therefore you can get sectors of diploid tissue on the haploids. This allows meiosis to occur both in the female side and the male side. And then those individuals can be self-pollinated, and this can produce a progeny that is now entirely homozygous. So this will produce new, completely homozygous lines without the otherwise many generations of self-pollinations, which takes seven or eight uh, growing seasons to achieve um, near um, homozygous lines. So this is a, a shortcut for making new lines. So uh, what is known in maize is that chromosomes from the inducer line are sometimes transferred to the haploids, and we suspected that this could be a potential means of transferring many chromosomes to many target lines uh, via the haploids and then doubling them. We could add transgenes to any number of targets without the need to integrate them through natural crosses. So we and others have shown in the proof of concept that if one incorporates B chromosomes into the haploid inducer lines, 
they in fact can be transferred to the haploids, and the chromosomes depicted here illustrate such a case. The chromosomes that have the green signal are the B chromosomes, and then there are 10 other chromosomes that were inherited from the female parent, indicating that this is a haploid plant that has gained the B chromosomes from the haploid inducer. In our studies, this occurs in about one out of 25 haploids, which is a sufficiently great frequency for high throughput studies of uh, identifying haploids that may have a mini chromosome present. So what we believe this will allow is the testing of transgenes in multiple or novel backgrounds. Transgenes don't always behave the same in different backgrounds. And so one can immediately test for this uh, by this kind of a transfer without having to integrate the transgene through multiple back crosses. There's no linkage drag because it's on an independent chromosome. This will also uh, allow then the extension of CRISPR-Cas9 editing to lines that are poorly transformed or that cannot be transformed. And this will then um, uh, expand the realm of genome editing in those species that can have this kind of transgene, mini chromosome transgene transfer. So depicted here is how this works. You have in a fertilization event an egg from the maternal parent, a sperm from the paternal parent. In this particular case, it also contains a mini chromosome. So some of the time you get a zygote that is diploid, it carries the mini chromosome. Other times you get a maternal haploid that has only the maternal chromosome. And then we suppose based upon our proof of concept for the B chromosome that the maternal haploid chromosome set can be inherited together with the mini chromosome. These can then be doubled and the chromosome now will be, the mini chromosome will be present now in a completely homozygous line. So we believe that this can be extended then to editing, as we mentioned, and we can edit potentially in haploids for a massive scale edit, editing many targets all at once. What is often the case in editing is that what occurs at the two different alleles present in the diploid is not the same. And so by editing in a haploid, one can avoid this complication entirely. And because the edit edits are now on different chromosomes but are in a haploid, the whole genome edit can be captured without any issue of independent assortment of the different edits that are occurring on different chromosomes. So we are placing uh, Cas9 then onto uh, an engineered mini chromosome. And then uh, that will have the potential uh, that we can edit many different sites in a haploid by introducing it into a haploid. And then upon doubling, the small chromosome, as we mentioned, cannot appear in meiosis 1. And therefore, even though it is, it is doubled, upon selfing that individual, you will now get a completely homozygous line where the edits identical in both alleles and some of the progeny will not inherit the editing transgene and it can be then selected away from the edited genome. So by way of summary, plant synthetic chromosomes can be initiated by telomere mediated truncation. This particular procedure has been uh, demonstrated in all of the tested plant species of which we are aware. It will bypass the epigenetic nature of centromeres. If one takes a centromere out of the cell and tries to put it back in, the epigenetic nature prevents it from functioning. But telomere mediated transformation and truncation uh, keeps the centromere in the cell. It never leaves the cell and therefore it bypasses this particular aspect of centromere function. Telomere mediated truncation is sufficiently efficient to produce mini chromosomes very easily. We did not talk about it, but we can add a, additional genes by site specific recombination. Of course, B chromosomes can serve as an excellent target and are stabilized by truncation. 
But as we mentioned, highly deleted A chromosomes can be recovered in tetraploids, in helotrisomics, or even in diploids. The potential for stacking a large number of transgenes is now present with engineered mini chromosomes, and these can be combined with double haploid breeding to transfer the transgenes to new lines very easily. This technique has the potential as a tool to facilitate massive scale genome editing for the mass production of proteins and useful metabolites, to add multiple new properties to plants, and of course, for basic studies of chromosomes made to order and as a genetic tool. We are aware that truncation has been demonstrated in Arabidopsis, brassica, wheat, barley, and rice, and so we think that it has applicability to most plants that are of interest to most investigators. So in concluding, I'd like to note here the contributors to mini chromosome synthesis in the past and present. The present team consists of Patrice Albert, Chang Zing Zhao, Matt Graham, Nathan Swires, Morgan McCall, and John Cody. I also want to thank the National Science Foundation for our funding for these experiments that we have performed on engineered mini chromosomes. In this final slide, we have references to the production of engineered mini chromosomes and citations to the source of the figures. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Dr. Birchler. We now proceed to Dr. Dan Voitoff, who will talk about editing plant genomes with sequence-specific nucleases. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to uh, deliver this webinar here today. Um, I'm Dan Voitoff. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota, um, where we work on developing gene editing technologies, developing and implementing them. And I also serve as the chief science officer for Calix. A small biotech company where we're using sequence specific nucleases to make new crop varieties. And I'll draw today as in my seminar on uh, on examples from from uh, both of my work environments. So it's a very exciting time in the realm of, of gene editing. We now have tools um, that allow us uh, to go into living cells and make very precise alterations uh, to the genetic code. Um, this has been a desire of plant biologists for decades, um, and now we have these tools in hand, and, and um, there are really two applications. One is a, a basic biological application, and that is to really go in and dissect gene function, understand how genes work. We can go in and make targeted alter alterations to gene sequences and test uh, how they affect phenotype. Um, and then uh, also, of course, we can harness information that we gather about uh, plant gene function to create new crop varieties, um, introduce traits of value um, into really any number of, of plant uh, species. So actually, you know, I, as, as I said, I have two professional roles as a professor and as a chief science officer, and, and uh, I explore really both of these avenues, the basic biological goal of understanding how genes work, using the technology, and then also creating uh, new crop varieties. So how do you go about uh, editing a plant genome? Um, actually the, the key is to introduce a targeted DNA double strand break uh, in your gene that you want to modify. Um, and that's shown in this slide here, uh, the very first step uh, we have at the top. Uh, a simple uh, DNA molecule uh, that's been broken. Um, and then after the break is introduced, the cell uh, takes over. The cell's DNA repair machinery takes over and uh, tries to uh, repair the break. And there are two, basically two pathways by which break repair occurs, and they have two different types of outcomes in terms of, of gene editing. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have uh, the repair pathway non-homologous end joining, 
And as its name implies, you just take the broken chromosome ends and, and re-ligate them together. Um, this is most often precise, but occasionally you have the gain or loss of a, a few nucleotides at the break site, and as a consequence, you create a targeted mutation. Um, so where the break occurs, uh, as I said, typically, probably more typically, you have a loss of nucleotides at that break site, a handful. Um, and if the break occurs in a coding sequence, you can this will result in the loss of gene function. The second uh, DNA repair pathway is homologous recombination. Uh, in this case, we introduce the break, uh, but we provide a DNA repair template. And that template has identity to the target locus, but it also has some modification that you're interested in incorporating. Uh, the modification could be a, a single base alteration. Um, it could be many base alterations, or uh, it could even be a, a piece of foreign DNA, a trans gene, that you want to incorporate uh, into the genome at the break site. Um, and so uh, the, in, in, the, in the slide, the, the new information that you want to incorporate into the genome is shown in green. And so the broken chromosomes recognizes the flanking homology and crossover or, or homologous recombination occurs and the information is copied uh, into, the, into the break site. This is a very powerful application of the technology uh, because it really allows you to create any type of modification you want to the target uh, plant genome. So bake re br DNA break repair is key uh, for gene, to gene editing. And, and for many years, the question was, what's the best, easiest, and most efficient way to make that targeted DNA double-strand break. You need that targeted break in order to uh, launch the gene editing process. And so over the years, a, a number of targeted nucleases have been developed, nuclease platforms have been developed, uh, that allow us to go into a genome, a complex genome, billions of nucleotides. Uh, I, uh, these nucleases find a specific sequence in the genome and create that, that double-strand break. Um, this slide shows a few of the common classes of, of engineered nucleases uh, that have been developed and that are widely used. Uh, the first are zinc finger nucleases. Um, a zinc finger is a protein motif that recognizes uh, DNA, usually three base pairs, uh, and it's that this is the zinc finger there for that this zinc finger domain that provides uh, the, the specificity for the nucleases. So you can string together, uh, shown here, are, are two uh, zinc finger nuclease monomers, um, uh, each of which has three zinc fingers targeting, each of which targets uh, nine base pairs. So the, the depicted zinc finger nucleases would target uh, 18 base pairs, and that usually provides requisite specificity to find your site in the genome. Um, more recently, uh, the talons have emerged, um, and these are also very powerful um, gene targeting reagents. They use a, a protein motif as well, the tal effector motif. Uh, these come from proteins made by uh, plant pathogens of the genus Anthemonas. This, this motif is, uh, is un basically recognizes one base pair, so what's depicted here, those colored boxes. Rep represent different tal effector motifs, each of which targets a single base. And again, you can string them together um, in an order that, in, in the desired order that will provide the requisite target specificity. Um, you fuse them to a nuclease, which is shown in red, and then the nuclease dimerizes once the tal effectors find their target and you create the break. Uh, most recently, and a widely popular What's become a widely popular gene editing reagent are the CRISPR-Cas reagents. Um, in the, in, for CRISPR-Cas, DNA targeting is achieved by base pairing as opposed to uh, through the use of uh, protein motifs that recognize DNA. And so uh, what's shown here is the guide RNA paired to its target and complexed. The blue sphere represents Cas, the Cas uh, protein, typically Cas9. Um, and, and then it's in this uh, RNA-DNA uh, duplex that the Cas9 mediates cleavage, so it encodes its, its own nucleus to make the, 
the targeted double strand break. So um, as, as I indicated, uh, there are different ways to harness DNA repair to create different types of uh, mutations. Uh, the simplest uh, uh, means of creating a targeted make modification is through the use of non-homologous end joining. Uh, you just break the chromosome again, and when it rejoins, uh, there's an alteration at the break site. So in plants, uh, the most widely used strategies for making uh, targeted gene knockouts through uh, non-homologous end join uh, is depicted uh, in this slide. Um, what we do is we take a wild type plant and uh, What's shown here is our target gene of interest, uh, which resides on one of the chromosomes. And we create a transgenic plant that serves as an intermediate uh, for the mutagenesis procedure. So the little red box sitting on one of the chromosomes represents the transgene uh, that we've introduced into the plant genome. And this transgene uh, encodes, or usually you have a selectable marker, uh, but uh, the important transgene is uh, the nuclease of interest that's been integrated into the genome. And then as that transgenic plant uh, grows and develops, uh, the nuclease uh, becomes expressed and it scans the genome, um, finds the target site uh, for which it's been engineered, in this case the coding sequence for our gene of interest, and then uh, a targeted uh, double-strand break um, is made um, and mutation results. Um, what you can then do is after you've uh, created uh, your mutant plant is you can, you can segregate away the transgene. So um, the final goal is to create a plant that just has the mutation that you've been interested in and no other foreign DNA. So I'm going to give you an example of uh, a targeted gene knockout that we made at Calix, uh, the company uh, where I serve as a, the chief science officer. Um, and uh, in this case, the uh, I'm going to give an example of a of a targeted modification that we introduced uh, into soybean. And it's this type of modification that I'm going to describe is similar to many other uh, modifications that are being created. Uh, in laboratories and companies throughout the world, and uh, very soon are going to the, the genetic inf in variation that's been created with the nucleases um, will certainly enter the food supply in, in the very near future. So uh, we targeted uh, soybean because, of course, it's a very important commodity crop. Um, it's the number one source of, of protein for animal feed, and and. Uh, when the soybean grain, or when the soybeans are, are pressed, uh, um, oil is also extracted, and it's the number two source of oil uh, for human uh, consumption. So, uh, one of the problems with soybean oil um, as as uh, you know a source of of cooking oil is that it is uh, very low naturally low in monounsaturated fats. So this slide shows that about 23% of the fatty acids in soybean oil are monounsaturated, and the bulk is polyunsaturated fats. Um, this is in contrast to like sunflower, or olive, or canola oil, where uh, monounsaturated fats predominate. Um, so in order to uh, improve soybean oil, in the past it was chemically treated, hydrogenated, to increase uh, the fraction of monounsaturated fats. And uh, one unfortunate side product of hydrogenation is the production of trans fatty acids. And so these are not healthy when consumed, and the Food and Drug Administration has mandated that uh, trans fatty acids be removed from the U.S. diet. Um, and as a consequence, uh, the value and demand for soybean oil uh, has decreased over um, over the past uh, decade or so. So our goal was to create a targeted mutation that would create increase the monounsaturated fats and create a healthier uh, soybean oil. 
So this slide just is a schematic of uh, the fatty acid uh, biosynthetic pathway um, uh, in which uh, palmitic acid is converted to oleic acid and then with oleic acid being a monounsaturated fat. And then it's acted upon by the FAD2 gene, a fatty acid desaturase, uh, and converted into a polyunsaturated fat, uh, linoleic acid. So our goal was to just eliminate in the modified pathway is to remove the fatty acid desaturase genes um, and increase the proportion of, of oleic acid. And so what we did is we engineered, uh, in this case, a talon uh, to recognize uh, the fatty acid desaturase genes. And, and by the mechanism I described, we grew up a transgenic plant, screened uh, that plant and its progeny for mutations in the fatty acid desaturase gene uh, and we're able to obtain um, our plant. And so uh, uh, the outcome um, is shown here. Um, we've created now a uh, high oleic, calyx high oleic HO oil is depicted on the slide um, at the top next to between sunflower and olive oil. And you can see in contrast to the regular soybean oil, we've greatly increased uh, the monounsaturated fats, making the oil uh, much more like um, the healthier plant oils of sunflower and olive oil. So, so this slide shows uh, an example of the types of mutations that are created by talons. So in bold are the sequences that uh, we engineered the talon vector uh, domain to, to recognize. Those are the, the bases recognized by the, uh, the DNA binding motif. And then between those two uh, sequences in bold is the site where the nuclease cleaves, and it creates a break, a targeted break uh, between those two binding sites. And then, as I mentioned, uh, you typically have a loss of nucleotides at the break site, and, um, and that's depicted here. These are independent mutations. Uh, each line represents uh, a different mutation uh, that we created through the use of talons. And these types of mutations can easily be identified by you know, PCR and, and DNA sequence analysis, for example. And, uh, and finally, since the plants, since you've segregated away the transgene in the end, uh, the plants really have only this alteration in their genome. And uh, the question is, this is sort of a new way of introducing genetic variation and regulatory authorities such as the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, um, they've concluded that uh, these plants are, are not regulated, and so we can take, uh, of course, you, you have to ask the USDA before you do this, but you can take the plants that you create and, and, and very easily go from the, the laboratory to the field and test and see uh, how, the, be, how the, the phenotype or what the phenotype of the plant is uh, out in the real world. So uh, I'd like to talk little bit now about the second mechanism of DNA repair, which is homologous recombination. And again, in homologous recombination, we are introducing our break, um, but we're also providing a template uh, to facilitate uh, break repair. And a challenge in plants has been, well, homologous recombination has been difficult to achieve because you do need both components, the nuclease and the repair template. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about strategies and technology we've developed in my lab at the University of Minnesota uh, to deliver these reagents, both the nuclease and uh, the repair template, the donor molecule, uh, ways to deliver them uh, more effectively. And, uh, you know, the reason for, for really uh, working hard on uh, homologous recombination is that we wanted to to capture all the potential that homologous recombination offers for targeted genome modification. And this slide just shows, you know, you know, there's a lot of interest in manipulating carbohydrates, fatty acids, proteins, uh, the products of plants that uh, enter the food supply, but um, also ways to increase productivity by making plants more tolerant to abiotic and biotic stresses or to harvest the many uh, secondary metabolites that plants produce, um, lots of compounds of value for pharmaceuticals or specialty chemicals. 
Let's see. So a challenge in plant uh, gene editing through the use of homologous recombination is, as I said, is you have to deliver both the nuclease and the, and the repair template. And this is typically done by, you know, the transformation methods that have been developed, many of them decades ago. So we can integrate the nuclease and the donor, or we deliver them by uh, transformation methods such as agrobacterium or biolistics. Um, sometimes we create a stable transgenic intermediate that, that carries the nuclease and the repair template. Uh, there's a few plant species uh, that we can deliver the reagents to uh, in protoplasts and then regenerate plants from these protoplasts. However, it's really only a small number of plant species that you can do this for. Uh, and it's time consuming and requires a lot of tissue culture expertise. Uh, so what we decided to do is to uh, harness plant viruses uh, to uh, make gene editing more efficient. And particularly we're interested in the Gemini viruses which have circular DNA genomes so they can express the nuclease and provide the donor molecule for repair. And they also, uh, they don't integrate into the genome and uh, but they rather replicate uh, the high copy number and then are eventually lost. Uh, so they're transient in nature. And so the way that uh, our Gemini virus does work, um, in, or in order to make them suitable for, for homologous recombination, uh, what we've done is we've taken away the movement protein and the coat protein from the virus. This is a schematic of the, the the upper part of the figure is a schematic of the bean yellow dwarf virus genome. We've gotten rid of the movement and coat proteins and replaced them with our sequence specific nuclease of choice, uh, talon or CRISPR Cas reagent, and then also provide uh, a donor molecule. And so um, the, the way uh, that we uh, use these, these modified viruses, we refer to them as replicons, is we deliver them to plant cells by agrobacterium. Uh, what's shown in this slide is the bacterium infecting the plant cell, delivering the linear tDNA uh, to the nucleus. But then in the presence of the rep protein, uh, the replicon circularizes and amplifies to a high copy number. Um, so in, in so doing, the nucleus gets expressed, it finds a target site in the genome, makes the break, uh, and then the donor molecule um, mediates repair. Um, so uh, just to give you an example of how this works, um, I'll show some data from one of our, our published papers. Um, and so um, what, we, what we did initially was target an, an integrated uh, transgene. Um, so if you were going to use replicons, you would most likely want to modify a gene of interest in the genome. But, but for this study, we integrated this uh, GUS-NPT2 fusion, uh, which is shown here. And uh, the, the middle, uh, in the middle is what's present in the plant genome. It's actually a defective GUS-NPT2 fusion. We removed 600 base pairs. And what's shown at the top is our replicon um, that has a nuclease that will, this ZIF-268 is a nuclease, a zinc finger nuclease actually, that will create a break between the GUS and NPT2 coding sequences. And then also on the replicon is the donor molecule uh, it has 1 kb of homology that in, in it, which flanks 600 base pairs of sequence information that's missing from the GUS NPT2 transgene. So GUS and NPT2 are both defective, but after recombination, what you see at the bottom is that you've restored GUS coding sequence and NPT2 coding sequences, and so you can select cells in the presence of canamycin um, uh, resistance being provided by the NPT2 gene, or you can stain the cells, uh, and they'll turn blue due to the fact that they have, they're expressing uh, GUS protein. And so uh, just to show how this works, we infiltrated tobacco leaves uh, with agrobacterium uh, that carries our replicon, and the tobacco plants are transgenic, and, and, and in the chromosome is that reporter gene. And um, <clears throat> uh, this slide, shows uh, the results of our gene editing experiment. So at the very bottom, we just have a standard agrobacterium tDNA. It has a nuclease and a donor molecule for repair. And what's shown uh, to the right of the, uh, of the sketch of, or, or the figure of the, 
of the tDNA is a piece of the plant leaf tissue that's been stained for gus activity. And you can see maybe a dark spot or two, which indicates a cell that has undergone a recombination and is now expressing uh, the gus protein. Um, at the, um, at, we also have a no rep control where we have a construct that has a replicon, but it doesn't have uh, any replicase, so it really just behaves like the tDNA. And again, you see a few uh, dark spots. But if we uh, go ahead and add the replicase to our uh, replicon, it'll amplify the high copy number. And then when we stain tissue that's been treated with the replicon, you can see many, many blue spots uh, here and well, black spots in this black and white uh, image. But you can see that the efficiency um, of recombination uh, is much, much higher in using the replicon. And uh, you can, of course, then quantify this, and, and that's what's shown in, in uh, the next slide. Um, you know, these are four different lines of tobacco that carry the transgene, and what we've seen is, uh, you know, on average, 25-fold increase in homologous recombination using the replicon uh, relative uh, to standard uh, tDNA. And then to uh, more recently, uh, we've been implementing the technology uh, in a variety of plant species. And so what we have here now is our wild type plant. And uh, we've integrated the nuclease uh, uh, and the donor molecule on uh, the replicon. And what happens is uh, you know, when we deliver it to the plant cell, um, the, the replicon amplifies to a high copy number, the nuclease makes a target, and then we affect repair. So um, the replicon is an abundant source of, of, of both the nuclease and, and the repair template. So um, more recently, as I said, we've been testing this in other plants, and I'll give you an example of gene editing uh, in tomato. Um, our target in tomato was in the ANT1 gene, which uh, produces anthocyanin pigments. So this is just a slide showing what happens when you overexpress ANT1. Um, you get these purple pigments that accumulate in all tissues. And so we engineered a replicon that uh, carried uh, a talon, basically, that would make a break in the ANT1 promoter. And then we recombined in um, uh, a strong promoter to drive ectopic ANT1 expression as well as an NPT2 transgene. And what we can see is that we treated uh, tomato leaf tissue and created callus. You can see the purple callus emerging. Uh, these derive from cells uh, that have undergone homologous repair, and uh, we've incorporated the strong promoter at the ANT1 locus. And uh, again, uh, the frequency was was greatly, the frequency of recombination was greatly enhanced by using the replicons. And so we can see here that uh, about 7% of the X plants had undergone uh, gene targeting compared to, you know, 1% uh, or so um, in the absence of, of the replicon. So we've got a big boost in obtaining the desired uh, recombination outcome. And uh, these replicons seem to work uh, quite broadly in a variety of plant species. And uh, they can be used uh, to create heritable mutations, uh, which is shown um, here uh, in this slide where we have uh, segregating uh, edited plants uh, gave rise to fruit and then the seeds were planted. And you can see the, the edited allele is giving rise to the purple seedlings. Um, as opposed to the to the green seedlings. So uh, the replicons have proven very, very valuable, and we've made the reagents uh, freely available at Agene, a non-for-profit uh, clone repository. So I thought I would just uh, summarize here um, briefly. Um, I, I told you about the two different pathways by which broken chromosomes are repaired, non-homologous end joining uh, gives rise to gene knockouts, and these are typically created by 
uh, making a transgenic intermediate that expresses the nuclease and then identifying progeny uh, that carry the mutation of interest. Uh, gene targeting is challenging and is really the number one challenge going forward to make gene targeting more efficiently, more efficient. Um, and I told you about the Gemini virus re replicons uh, that we developed that increase gene targeting frequencies considerably in, in a wide variety of plant species. So we think a novel means of delivering these reagents, um, and we, we believe viruses provide a novel means of delivering these agents, reagents, and uh, I think there's a lot of room to improve frequencies of, of gene targeting uh, further. So finally, just a brief acknowledgement. Um, the soybean story, as I mentioned, was carried out at, by the scientists at Calix, and this is a picture of my laboratory at the University of Minnesota and uh, some of the scientists who contributed to the work I spoke about today. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Boitas. Um, before we proceed to the question and answer segment, I'd like to very briefly tell you about the newest protocol journal from Current Protocols, which is Current Protocols in Plant Biology. Uh, that launched this year, earlier this year, and includes Dr. Birchler on the editorial board of all highly accomplished plant scientists. And new protocols will be added quarterly to this new current protocols in plant biology. So let's go ahead to the question and answer segment. So if you haven't yet submitted a question for Dr. Birchler or Dr. Voitas, now is the time to do so by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. So let's go ahead. Uh, first question, I believe, is for Dr. Birchler. It says, are many chromosomes stable in many generations of plants? Yes. So we have looked at the stability of the many chromosomes that we've produced, and they have uh, stability in the life cycle and uh, pretty much throughout uh, all cells that we've ever been able to uh, assay. And we have uh, many of the engineered mini chromosomes that we have maintained for many years uh, through genetic crosses. So, so they are maintained uh, over many generations and somatically uh, throughout the whole life cycle. Uh, probably the reason for this is, as noted in the presentation, the centromeres of those that we have made are endogenous centromeres, and so they are perfectly normal centromeres that are used on these engineered mini chromosomes. All right. Uh, next question, I believe, is for Dr. Boitas. It says, how can we check the potential CRISPR-Cas9 efficiency before actual transformation to plants? Uh, yes, the, the way that we typically do it is in transient assays. Um, so often we'll make a protoplast from the plant species that we're interested in, in editing, and then through simple polyethylene glycol mediated transformation, we'll introduce our nuclease into those cells, and then after a day, make DNA from the preparation and look for mutations at the target site. So it's hard to grow protoplast from any plants, but in this case, we're just asking the cells to survive for a day or two, and so we can really get a good readout of how well the nucleases are acting on their target. Okay, next question I believe is for Dr. Birchler. Um, it says, how variable is the copy number of mini chromosomes between individuals, and does this have any consequences on expression levels of transgenes? So the mini chromosomes that we basically maintain are in a single copy from one generation to the next, and so there basically is no variation. We can, using the B chromosome of maize, however, manipulate the dosage of mini chromosomes artificially and run up the copy number. The truncated B chromosomes are basically stabilized by that truncation event. B chromosomes have a natural non-disjunction function at the second uh, polymitosis, which is part of their accumulation mechanism. But the very tip of the chromosome is needed for that, and the truncation event gets rid of it, so it stabilizes the chromosome. 
And one can add back a normal B chromosome and then confer onto the mini chromosomes the non disjunction property. We've been able to successfully increase the copy number of some engineered mini chromosomes up to uh, over 15 copies. I think the highest copy number was 19 copies of the engineered mini chromosome. So one can actually increase the copy number if you are using a B chromosome derived derivative. Those that we have from the A chromosomes are um, do not undergo this non disjunction and so they are maintained uh, in, in a single copy number from one generation to the next. All right. Uh, next question is for Dr. Boyd. Uh, it says, are there any limitations in terms of the size of insertions you've been able to achieve? Is this something that currently is limited to small sequences or genes, and would it be possible to, to do a sequence that includes multiple genes? Uh, yeah, it certainly is possible to introduce uh, large DNA fragments uh, into the genome. So if you're using the repair pathway, the homologous recombination repair pathway, uh, usually the larger the modification you incorporate, uh, the less efficiency you have in terms of achieving your outcome. Um, uh, our replicons that I described in, in my talk, we've been able to uh, deliver uh, one or more transgenes of up to about uh, 10 kb. But again, the larger you get, the less efficient it is. You can also harness the, the other repair pathway, the end joint pathway, and introduce basically a DNA fragment that contains your transgenes of interest and break the chromosome, and you'll simply then just join through non-homologous end joining uh, the DNA fragment uh, into the genome. And people, uh, my colleagues who've carried out such experiments find the end joining incorporation of one or more transgenes is you know, a fewfold at least more efficient than uh, homologous recombination. So that's another strategy. Okay. Um, next question, um, I believe, may be for Dr. Voitas. It says, do you think it will be possible to do gene editing without using a selectable marker? Uh, it's a great question because, uh, yeah, we and particularly if you're interested in developing crop varieties, you don't want to incorporate uh, foreign DNA. So I think it, uh, it really comes down to efficiencies. If we can get the efficiencies high enough and we can reliably recover plants uh, with edits, then we can simply screen for the ones, um, molecularly screen for the ones that have the edit without having to invoke selection. I think... Uh, Perhaps it, it might be, we might need a compromise until we get to that point. That is, maybe we'll do two gene edits. We'll edit a gene to confer herbicide tolerance to the plant so that we can uh, identify cells that have undergone editing and then screen those for edits that have occurred at, at our locus of interest. And then we can just perhaps segregate away the, the herbicide tolerance that we created if, if we're not interested in having that in the genome. But for now, it seems that we need, since the efficiencies are, are low enough and the transformation is a challenge in many plant species, we, we do seem to need to invoke some means of selection. Okay. There's lots of great questions here, and I, I don't know that we can get to all of them, but we'll do a, a few more here in, in, the, in the next few minutes. Uh, the next question, I believe, is for Dr. Birchler, and it asks, what is the efficiency of telomere-mediated truncation? In other words, how easily can engineered mini-chromosomes be produced? So this is from the various laboratories who have conducted telomere-mediated truncation. There's been uh, a great variability in the efficiency. Ironically enough, in the experiments that we did uh, when we first uh, tried telomere mediated truncation in maize, uh, the efficiency uh, perhaps was around 10% uh, of those uh, transformants that we re recovered. In Arabidopsis, where it was done in tetraploid individuals, the frequency of truncation of those that were recovered was much higher than that. And in brassica and in wheat that I'm aware of, um, these are all, of course, um, uh, polyploid species, and therefore the truncation events have no selection against them. 
And indeed, in our experiments where we have extra B chromosomes present, they seem to be recovered as truncated events more uh, easily and efficiently than A chromosome truncations, and this is because we believe the truncations some of the time are selected against in the transformation procedure. But uh, truncated chromosomes have been produced in a, a variety of species, and it's basically efficient enough to to recover um, engineered mini chromosomes. Once you have them, then you're all set. All right. Um, next question, I believe, is for Dr. Voitoff. It says, can gene editing be accomplished without stable transformations? Uh, yeah, it certainly can. So really all we need to do is to deliver the reagents in, into the cell. Um, and then, um, you know, once inside the, the, the cell, they can carry out their activity. They can make the targeted break. And if you're doing homologous or combination, you can, you know, copy in the information from the donor or the repair template uh, that you provide. Um, and it, it sort of gets back to the other question. We often do stable transformation because we invoke a selectable marker and we say, okay, now we've created a plant that contains our reagents, and then we screen the progeny of that plant for the targeted modification. But if you have an effective means of getting DNA into cells, um, uh, certainly transient delivery will work. For example, when we use protoplasts, potato protoplasts, for example, we get high frequencies of uptake of our reagents maybe 70 to 80 or even 90% of the cells take up the reagents. And then you don't have to invoke any selection. Uh, you can just simply screen um, plants that have been regenerated from those protoplasts and, and identify the modification. And when you look at those plants, they haven't incorporated the DNA. So the DNA was clearly delivered transiently and the modification occurred through transient delivery. Okay, next question. We can take probably a couple more says, are there positions on chromosome sites that are resistant to Cas9 nuclease digestion? It seems uh, Cas9 is actually very effective at, at finding its targets, whether it's in euchromatin or heterochromatin. There's a little bit differences. There have been reported differences in efficiency, so some sites are, are in fact, uh, more amenable to modification. But success has been achieved um, in domains of heterochromatin in terms of tar demonstrating targeted cleavage and repair, um, both in centromeric and telomeric heterochromatin. So Cas9 seems to be quite an efficient agent at finding its target site. Okay, one more. I believe this is also to Dr. Voitas. Uh, the question is, is CRISPR-mediated gene introduction accepted as a non-GMO if you screen out the selectable marker? So in the United States, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has made public uh, their opinion on this, um, and in several cases, and a number of different nucleases, zinc finger nucleases, talons, and CRISPR-Cas, um, if you make a targeted gene knockout, that is, you remove uh, a handful of nucleotides to not inactivate a gene, um, and then as, you're, as you implied in your question, you segregate away the transgene so you make sure there's no foreign DNA in the plant chromosome. The USDA has given clearance, um, has, has declared that such plants are not regulated, and so that allows you to go from the laboratory basically into field trials um, or field tests, to, um, which is uh, you know a big advantage because it's ultimately in the field where you want to test the phenotypes. But the USDA still requests before doing so that you uh, that you run the, you know, that you inform them of the plant you've created and get their opinion. And they have a, a website uh, and am I regulated? If you Google am I regulated in USDA, uh, you can find that website and instructions on how to to make an inquiry of whether or not the targeted modification you you make would be, not be regulated. All right, we are uh, more than out of time. We went over time a bit, but I uh, hope we got to quite a few of the questions. So I'm now going to conclude the, the Q&A session. I'd like to let listeners know that today's webinar has been recorded and will be available for viewing in the next few days. We will send you an email with details on how to access the recorded webinar 
along with instructions on how to personalize and print a certificate of attendance. So on behalf of today's speakers, Dr. James Birchler and Dr. Dan Voitoff, and the American Society of Plant Biologists, we sincerely appreciate your attending today's webinar, and we look forward to your attendance at future events from current protocols.